And welcome back to another episode of What Do You Know About Sports? We've uh, had a couple of weeks off here for uh, various reasons, uh, but uh, we are back and it's good to see everyone again. Gary Jeffries to my left, longtime university coach, both football and basketball. And to my right, Lance Roberts, a longtime NHL referee and still very active on the officiating side uh, as an off-ice official in the Canadian Hockey League. And myself, Randy Steinman, a longtime sportscaster, now retired. And fellas, uh, g- great to see you again. Lots happening since we last spoke. And uh, I guess the biggest news of the, the last few days in, uh, in football was uh, a couple of football uh, playoff games that were mm-hmm. of, of interest to viewers in Southern Ontario. You had the Buffalo Bills on one end of Lake Erie suffering heartache again. You had the Detroit Lions on the other end of Lake Erie uh, winning and going to an NFC uh, championship game for the first time ever. And uh, Gary, what are your thoughts uh, about the the poor Buffalo Bills and and their fans? I mean, just uh, another heartbreaking loss to Kansas City. Yeah, I I felt horrible for them again. I I was uh, was certainly cheering for them, um, but... uh, and to have ended, uh, you know, the way it did, um, which, which j- just brought back uh, more bad memories uh, of uh, of the wide right, uh, Scott Norwood, and now now Tyler Bass. And, uh, but uh, it, it was a great football game. Uh, it it, uh, it was back and forth. Uh, we got uh, two of the the premier quarterbacks uh, in football going head to head, and. Uh, you know, it. it uh, I felt. Uh, I felt badly for for Josh. Um, he uh, he seems to. He, t- he takes the brunt of the the criticism uh, for not getting it done. Um, I, I looked. At, I looked at the stats. Um, Buffalo ran 31 more plays, and they had the ball for 14 more minutes. <laughs> um, and, and somehow, uh, you know, didn't win the football game. And I, I kind of pin it a little bit on, uh, or not a little, maybe more than a little, uh, on that Buffalo defense. They, uh, they were just decimated uh, the, the, all year. But uh, going into this game, uh, that, that certainly wasn't the, the defense that uh, you know that they intended to play uh, into the into the off season or in, into the playoffs. Um, <coughs> and uh, you know they, they uh, it was too easy. It was too easy for Mahomes. Uh, he'd move the ball down the field and, you know, three or four plays and, and, and uh, they get it in the end zone. Um, whereas Josh, he, he had to nickel and dime it uh, down the field and, and uh, uh, with the same result uh, un- until the last drive. Um, the one thing I saw, and I, I'm, a, I'm a huge uh, Josh Allen fan. Um, the one thing the kid did at the end of the game is he sought out Tyler Bass. And uh, you could see him going out the tunnel, and he goes over and, and, and gives a big kid a big hug, and uh, that that says a great deal about the character of uh, of Allen. And uh, but uh, anyhow, he mentioned, that, he mentioned that on the uh, <clears throat> interview. He did say that uh, they had the play, they had the chances to make the plays. He said you can't hang it on him. He, he he backed the kid up, which I really thought was special of Josh Allen to do that. When they did their uh, pre, pre, uh, post-game talk with him, and he yeah. talked a lot about the fact that you know it comes down to the fact that yeah, he, it's a kick away from being there. It's it sucks, he says, but you know we had our chances early to make the plays we needed to make, and it's all it's all you know. It just sucks that this was what the result was right. So I, I give him a lot of credit, Josh Allen, on that in that case, but I also give you know Mahomes a lot of credit. You know he seems to find ways to win this kid. In a lot of different situations, he just seems to make it happen. I don't know what what it is, but uh, you know they found a way again to, to win a football game they needed to do to go to the next uh, to the I think it's the, um, the the finals there for for the division. So he's you know he had to give him a little bit of credit too in regards to how they ran their football game. Well, I, I give I give him you know lots of credit. He he, he may be the best uh, when it, when it's all over. He might be the best that there ever was. Uh, he's a great athlete and a great quarterback. Um, my question would be, uh, if Josh Allen was on the other side and went against that Buffalo defense, how many points would he have put up? Uh, I, I just think it was uh, uh, it was too easy. It was too easy for Mahomes, and 
uh, the fact it was as close as it was uh, is a lot of credit to uh, to Buffalo. Yeah, I found Buffalo. There was times that they during the season where they you know they they went on strings of some awesome football, and then then they had their moments, you know, that just seemed to just falter at times in games they should have won, even you know, as in, during the season. And it just seemed to be the way that the season had gone. That's why that, that's the way that game went. They just seemed to have it. They were going. They were in control, and then all of a sudden the wheels fell off. So it was kind of a you know a tough tough thing to, for the Buffalo fans to have to to lose that game. But I'll tell you, you know, it was a really great football game at the end of the day. Yeah, Tyler Bass. Even if he makes that kick, Mahomes still has about a minute forty five to uh, work with and uh, just get into field goal range, and Kansas City would win the game anyway. So to for for people to be putting that on Tyler Bass and you know the Scott Norwood comparisons and oh my gosh it's so unfair I I can't believe uh, I, I've seen I don't know if these are uh, these reports are accurate but I I've seen where uh, Tyler Bass has been getting death threats in Buffalo and some Buffalo rapper uh, I guess went on and, and made all kinds of uh, things that he would you know he wants to kill Tyler Bass and. I'm going, oh my gosh! Like, get a grip here, people. <laughs> Did Norwood go through that too in those games yeah. that uh, in the Super Bowl that they well, did they lose four in a row, didn't they? Buffalo in the Super Bowl. Yeah, and and the first I think it was the first one was the famous wide right against the Giants where he yeah. he had a chance to win it, not even tie it. This was a chance to win the game, and and that went wide right by a couple of feet. And he's never, you know, he's never been able to live that down. The poor guy. I mean. You know, and Tyler Bass the other day. I mean, it's cold. Yeah, he had the wind at his back, but it looked as I was looking at the flags, even as they were lining up for that kick, it looked like the wind was blowing left to right. And uh, and the ball, you know, Gary, the, the ball is cold. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't come off your foot quite as well as as it should. And you know, the snap, uh, the the center's uh, hands are cold. The the holder's hands are cold. All kinds of things can go wrong there. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, uh, it it's unfortunate when it's pinned on one person, and that uh, that's not fair. Um, you know, the one thing that's forgotten in all of this, um, and I haven't heard anybody speaking about it. Uh, when, when they went for it, that uh, they faked the the, the punt and, and went for it and didn't get it. Yeah. And then Kansas City goes down and fumbles the ball into the end zone. Like it, if if they score there, you know, the the, the game's probably over anyhow. Yeah. Um, so that you know, that's a coaching decision that's kind of been forgotten. Um, but uh, anyhow, there there are lot, 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 lots of places in that football game where the outcome could have been different. Yeah. Um, but uh, well, is, wide rights have become something of a fake. You're going to tell somebody that you you're, you're wide right whenever you tell them you're not doing something right or something like that. Yeah. Eh? You're yeah. too wide right, but let's take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> Well, on the other end, uh, things are going incredibly well in Detroit. Uh, I, about a month ago here, we were talking about this, and and I had said how nice it would be if the Lions could win a playoff game at home, and here they have won two in the last week. Uh, again, Gary, what are your thoughts? Is that a team that can go all the way here? Well, it's, uh, it's a Cinderella story, and it? it's, uh, it's been great. Uh, you know, Dan Campbell and and chewing off kneecaps and, and, and the way he came in and his, his initial interview. And uh, you got to like the guy and uh, you know, they, they go for it. They, they go for it all the time. And that uh, he's got a team there that's really believing yeah. uh, that they're, uh, uh, they're, they're fun to watch too. It, it was, it, I was really happy for Goff that, uh, you know, he, uh, he, he's won a couple now and, and, uh, Actually, I was hope I was, I was happy for Mayfield. I, I thought Mayfield again, another quarterback that's taken a lot of credit or a lot of uh, criticism uh, over the years. Uh, he played a heck of a game as well. It, it was another great football game. Um, but it, it's isn't it 31 years? I think I heard 31 years since they'd won a playoff game. Yeah. Uh, the, the only championship they ever won was back in 1957, uh, the, the days of Bobby Lane. Uh, you guys wouldn't. You probably don't know who he is, but uh, I remember watching him play with the, the high top uh, shoes and uh, cleats. Um, but uh, yeah, that the, you know to to go into San Francisco now, you know that that's a, a tall order. 
Uh, but I wouldn't rule them out. I, I wouldn't rule them out at all. Uh, they, they, they've been running the football, and, and the defense is tough. And and uh, like I said, they're they're uh, the, the, you know they're together. They they uh, they believe they can. And when it plays somebody that believes they can, you never know. So well, they, they, they're like a they're, they're a really interesting team to watch because I mean the coach has got character. Jared Goff has got character. They got a lot of people on that football team that really, you know, they're they're, they're kind of like the, uh, the, you know, the forgotten ones that weren't supposed to do really well. They're all out there battling. You know, it's a it's a great. I, I really really like this. I would really like to see them go all the way. They are they're a really interesting team. I, you know, the the characters on that club are really fun to watch. In that, you know, for what they're doing right now, and and of course Detroit's going crazy. Is you know having the Lions win. Haven't won since '57, like you said. I wasn't. I just got. I was just born that year, so I wasn't able to watch the game. So, yeah, I was still years away from being born. <laughs> yeah, one, I bet you are. Hey, one thing: uh, if if the Lions beat San Francisco and go to the Super Bowl, don't forget Jared Goff has Super Bowl experience. You don't really think of him as maybe no. being, but but he went to a Super Bowl with the Rams that one year before the trade with uh, Stafford. Uh, so he's got Super Bowl under his belt. He didn't win it, but he, he has that experience. So that's something to think about in his, his favor as well. But Baker Mayfield really did have a great year. That's for sure. He he had a good season. He played, you know, you know that last pass. I hope that's not just all that you know that, that they remember, but because he did a great job with that Tampa Bay team to get to where they were for sure. Yeah, yeah, he did. And, and two contrasting games when you think of it: Goff and Mayfield. Uh, you know, two kids that uh, pretty much stay in the pocket and and uh, don't move around a lot. You know, versus the other game where you got Josh and Mahomes and, and yeah. uh, so athletic and and and, uh, and mobile and and uh, and uh, you know, but two great great games and all four of them I thought were were outstanding and fun to watch. Yeah. Yep. All right, let's move on, guys. We got uh, some NHL news to talk about here this uh, week, where uh, a couple of uh, gentlemen have both. Uh, resurfaced in the NHL, and uh, maybe both of them were a bit of a surprise. Corey Perry w- was one who was one of our topics uh, a few uh, weeks ago. He has uh, signed a one-year contract with the Edmonton Oilers after that uh, uh, incident in Chicago. And Patrick Waugh has uh, turned up again as, a, as an NHL head coach with the New York Islanders. And uh, I... I Caught me a bit by surprise, um, Lance. Uh, what what are your thoughts as you uh, caught wind of both of these guys making their NHL returns? Well, I'm, I'm happy for Scott Perry. I think that uh, you know he went through a rough ride there. He, he's you know he's gone through the whole process of you know you know admitting to his mistake, changing his life, which is the best thing that's probably happening for him. When he was playing for the London Knights. There was speculation, you know, in the media and that, that he would never play in the NHL, wasn't a good enough skater and all these things and didn't have all the qualities. And they didn't really believe that he would make it to the NHL at one time. And I remember a game that was played between uh, Kitchener and uh, London in the playoffs in Kitchener. It was like, I think it was like a game six. And this was one vicious ser- series this, between DeBoer and Hunter. It was vicious. This series, there was some real bad, bad blood and there was some awful, you know, you know, animosity and things were going on with, uh, you know, hits were hard. It was really a vicious game, you know, series overall. But it was interesting because at one point in that series, Scott Perry and Michael Richards went at, went toe-to-toe at center ice in a fight that's still epic. And I remember being on, on the air with Rogers at the time, and I remember watching that fight and all the speculation about Scott Perry, and I said, if he can, if if Perry can go toe to toe with Michael Richards at center ice, he'll play in the National Hockey League. And he's had a a, a career of twelve hundred and seventy three games. This, this uh, Perry's had as a, as a player, and he's he's been a, a, an asset to every team he's played for. So I'm happy to see him, you know, turning it around and getting his opportunity with Edmonton. And it's funny because Edmonton seems to be that team that that seems to bring players like that to their team and they turn around and they become great players. Craig McTavish, what he went through in life, ended up back with the Oilers. They gave him his shot. He played great for them, won cups. You got Evander Kane there. You got all the stuff they went through with, with Grant Fear and all these you know issues they went through. And they always seem to find a way 
with the Oilers to pick these guys up and turn them into hockey players, and they go on with great careers after the fact. I, maybe it's the people from Edmonton, like myself from Edmonton, that are great looking after these people, and we could make sure that they that they do well, I guess, maybe. But it's a real interesting story. I'm really rooting for Scott Perry uh, highly, that hopefully that he, he does well. I really am. I don't know the man, but I hope he does well. Hey, Lance, <laughs> I just want to. I just want to. I know what happens sometimes. You get a wrong name in your head, but it's Corey Perry. Corey Perry, yeah, sorry. <laughs> call, that's okay. That, I, I've done the same, and you get it in your head once, and and you and you run with it. But you've, yeah. you're obviously re referring to Corey Perry. Corey Perry, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> and nice way to and nice way to take a Corey Perry Edmonton Oilers story and turn it into a, a pat on the back for yourself. Good job. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Because I knew he's going to be in the National Hockey League, and then going <laughs> Patrick Waugh. Patrick Waugh, well, he's another interesting guy. I roughed him when he played, and I and I I've met the man off the ice. He's a really quite a jovial guy. If you if you see Patrick Waugh well off the ice from on the ice, there's two different people there. He's a real happy guy, really nice man. I had a young fellow here that I had uh, met when I was on the ice still refereeing, and he had um, I got word back to me about he was struggling with cancer. This young fellow. And I remember talking to him. We were at a rink. My kids were figure skaters, and he was at the rink with his sister figure skating. And he, he told me he, his his idol was was Patrick Waugh. That this it was he wanted to be a goaltender. This young fella. So I, I thought to myself. I looked at my schedule. And I could see that I had uh, Colorado in uh, Arizona, and then they were back in San Jose. I had them like uh, a Friday night in in Arizona, then back in San Jose on a Saturday Sunday afternoon. So what I did is I went to the to the team and I and I asked the team I wanted to talk to Patrick Waugh, which I didn't get a chance to talk to him. But I said, "Can you give him a message?" And I gave him the kid's phone number, and I said, told him about the young fella and everything like that. And and I so he he went back and came back to me at my dressing room and said, "It's looked after," you know. Mm -hmm. So what Patrick Waugh did, which was remarkable, was that he took the he he called the kid up from the bus. On the game in San Jose, I saw Patrick Wall walking out towards the bus, and he looked at me and he went like this: "I got you covered." And uh, he, on the bus for for twenty minutes going to the airport, he talked to the kid on the phone about things, sent him stuff. The young fellow today is still going; he's 31, 32 years old, married, has everything going for him. We brought him to our training camp. So just as you know, sometimes people don't know who people are; they all have their opinions. But Patrick Wall is one one quality individual. I think he's going to make the Islanders a better team. What do you think, Gary? Well, I, I guess with with Perry, uh, uh, I think it's a great move for uh, for Edmonton in, in terms of making them better. Uh, I, I think he'll fit quite nicely into their their, their bottom six. Um, you know, with uh, with the experience he's he's had, I, I think he's been in in four Cup finals. Um, and uh, he's one of those kids that, uh, you know, he's a pain in the ass to play against. Um, you know, you, you don't like him when he's on the other team, but you'd love to have him on your team. Yeah. <clears throat> and so I, I think that's a, that, that's a great pickup uh, for Edmonton. And, and uh, you know, and hopefully he's got things, uh, you know, off the ice, uh, you know, back in order, or at least starting to get them back in order. Um, as far as what, as you say, Lance, you know, we, we don't know these guys, uh, you, you know, you, you certainly have, have got a bit of a relationship with them and, and know them, uh, you know, from just watching as a fan, um, you know, he, he, he came across, uh, you know, certainly the way he left Montreal was not ideal <clears throat> as a player. Um, but the, you know, there, there's a, there's a story there that, uh, you know, we're, we're not necessarily, uh, privy to. Um, as a coach, uh, he left the National Hockey League, uh, you know, in, in Colorado, um, you know, with a reputation of, of being a, you know, a, a real hard ass uh, on his players. And, and uh, um, but uh, he certainly had some success. Uh, he's been in junior hockey now for, what, over 10 years, I guess, to just won a Mem Cup. Uh, I think with the younger kids, you can get away a little bit uh, with, with uh, being harder on your, your your kids than what you maybe can in the National Hockey League. Um, anymore, it, it, it's pretty tough as a coach. <clears throat> if uh, you know, and, and how you treat them, you've got to be a social worker, not just a, an X's and O's guys, and and uh, and that's important. So uh, 
I think uh, I've, I've read here recently that, uh, you know, he's changed a little bit, and I, I think that's important. I think that's important uh, for him to go in there to, on the island to have success. He, he's, uh, he's got to maybe change his style uh, somewhat, and, uh, you know, we'll see. And, and with that story you just told me, I'm rooting for him. Yeah. Uh, you just told us. That, 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 that sounds like uh, the kind of guy that, uh, you, you know, you'd want to play for and uh, has great character. So. Um, uh, I, I'm rooting for him. I room for both. Rooting yeah. for both. Yeah, me too. I, I saw some video of the first Patrick Waugh practice that he was running with the Islanders, and it looks like he, you know, was being pretty hard nosed. And uh, you know, hopefully, he can turn things turn things around there. And success at the junior level for sure. I mean, he's won two Memorial Cups. Um, he, he did coach Colorado there for, uh, I believe, three seasons you know, eight, 10 years ago, uh, never won a playoff series. And, 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 and Corey Perry. Yeah. just, it's a guy people love to hate, but boy, he's been in three straight Stanley cups, um, as a player. And, uh, there's something about the guy that he just plays for winning teams and you want to have him on your team. So he hasn't won a cup yet though. That's his biggest thing. Now he has to win a cup. Oh, he didn't win one with Anaheim. I thought he did. Um, oh, maybe they did. I thought he, the last three they haven't won. He's been in the last three. Stanley yeah, Cups no, the, the last three years he's played. He's played on the on the team that came up short. But I I want to say he won a cup with Anaheim early in his career. I could be wrong about that. But well, might have. I'm not sure. Hopefully, uh, hopefully both these guys. Uh, I mean, they're they're both very well known figures in in the hockey world and in the NHL. And uh, yeah, I'm 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 pulling for both of these guys. We'll wait and see. It'll be interesting to see. Well, Lou Lamorello is, uh, he's noted for making these kind of decisions late, late in the, late in the season, pulling the coaches out. Bring, he brought in Robinson once, fired Robbie Fatorik just for the playoffs, went behind the bench himself. So, yeah, he, he has an effect. He usually knows what he's doing, Lamorello, that's for sure. <laughs> he, he, he brought in Jock Lemaire too, didn't he? Yeah, he might have. Yeah, he had Jock Lemaire there. Yeah. I think yes, he, he did. did. He did. This has been a real interesting week in, uh, in, my opinion in uh, the, the sports journalism world where uh, sports illustrated magazine has <laughs> essentially pulled the plug on itself, I guess um, by laying off most of its staff. Uh, it, it still isn't official that uh, the sports illustrated magazine is dead in the water, but they don't appear to have any people left now. So I'm not quite sure how they're going to um, continue but this is a, a, a magazine that uh, first published in 1954. Um, I don't know about you guys, but when when I was, you know, a, a teenager uh, through the 70s, Sports Illustrated was the one magazine I subscribed to. And I would read that thing cover to cover. Uh, and this was in the, you know, early, mid, late 70s, all through the 70s. And, you know, I can honestly say it had... Uh, probably a profound effect on my career in uh, sports broadcasting because uh, the articles were so good. And, uh, you know, I learned how to write. I learned how to report just by reading Sports Illustrated magazine. And uh, uh, their their new uh, publisher, uh, Arena Group, has uh, laid off most of its staff, you know, the writers, the photographers, the editors, and uh, we'll wait and see what's in the future for Sports Illustrated. But uh, what are your guys? I mean, you've been so active in, in sports. I'm sure Sports Illustrated magazine has has uh, been something that you've, at, at the very least, read quite a bit over the last uh, 30, 40 years. I, re I read a lot, Randy. In fact, I was in the Sports <laughs> Illustrated. Wow. That's my picture there with, with Rob Ray in this edition of the Sports Illustrated, see? So I got a big affiliation with the Sports Illustrated. <laughs> what year is that, Lance? What year is that issue? I'm not sure. It was about 19. Mm -mm. It was February 10th, 1997. Yeah. Well, it's, I'm getting yelled at by Rob Ray there again. <laughs> it wasn't the first time. But, yeah, I thought that the magazine, I read it all the time. It was It was actually, it was like the, I think for most people, it was like the the Bible to read the sports illustrated to do with sports, anything to do with sports, you're reading about it in sports illustrated. So yeah, magazines like that are going to be missed for sure. I mean, everybody gets their information off the internet now. So, yeah. you know, through, you know, through the, through the, that medium. So it's hard for, uh, for some of these magazines to last. 
Isn't it? Isn't it kind of across the board, Rand? It, it's uh, you know, print media now is uh, it's just not the same. And uh, you know, I I, I used to I, I can remember when I was back at school. Um, every morning it would be automatic. I I, I would uh, you know I, I'd go to the to Tim Hortons, get my coffee, and go next door to the variety store and get my newspaper. Hmm. And, and uh, every day. Um, you know, and, and uh, as, as Lance said, uh, the Internet now is just uh, it's consumed, uh, you know, the, the, the reporting. And and, uh, and since I moved up here to Southampton, I, I haven't I haven't I don't think I've looked at a newspaper mm. in the last eight or 10 years. And, and certainly Sports Illustrated, uh, you know, falls in that category. I, you know, it's been so long since I've, you know, I've, I've seen one. Um, but, uh, you know, everything's just so easy now. You just, just go to your phone and, and you've got everything right there. So it, it's, uh, it's unfortunate, uh, but that's, that's just, uh, that's life in 2024, I think. Yeah, I suppose. Yeah. Do you worry though, that, you know, future generations, uh, will suffer though with the demise of publications like this because, um, yeah, I guess you can still find everything on the internet. But as we all know, don't believe everything you read on the Internet. And, you know, it's it's very easy for anybody to, you know, post a, an article on the Internet, whether there's any truth to it or whether there's any accuracy to it. How do you really know? But at least with a magazine like Sports Illustrated, um, you know, and, and some of the best sports writers in the world, uh wrote for that publication at least you knew you could trust what you were reading and i guess from a from a journalism background um i, I just worry about where the the future of getting accurate information is, is is headed and and as young people today who are you know my age when i was reading sports illustrated you know where are they going to get their information from moving forward and and is it something that they're going to be able to trust well, the biggest thing, Randy, is that the inst it's instant information that they all look for. The thing about Sports Illustrated and, and, and even the, even podcasts like we're doing now, by the time it gets out there, or by the time the new, it comes on the stand, there's a whole new story happening in another direction, and they've already seen it on their phone. Now the, it's the next story. So yeah. that's the problem that you really run into is that you're kind of – you're coming. You're coming in late to the dance in most situations. If you're right, you know, for a magazine coming out monthly or something, because the stories have already been talked about, gone on, and they're on to something else. So it's how quickly things happen in the world to do with the, the medium now of internet and all the areas to find news, instant, you know, instant uh, information. So yeah. it's hard to compete with that. Yeah, uh, it, it, you know, it, it's based on the market, Rand, and and uh, you know that. There's just not a market for it, uh, or, or they wouldn't be laying off all these people and, and, and downsizing like they are. If, if there still was a, de a demand, then uh, you know it, it would continue as as it was. But uh, uh, unfortunately, that it's just not there. Not not like it used to be. Yeah. No, you're right. And you're going to miss the swimsuit. You're going to miss the swimsuit edition, Randy. That's all you're worried about is the swimsuit edition. <laughs> What's so that, Lance? I'm, I'm unfamiliar with that. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. You know what? I do remember how how uh, <laughs> how big a thing that that was when the first when, when the first swimsuit issues started. I'm going to say early '70s, and and uh, the 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 backlash that Sports Illustrated got for that issue yeah. in, in in its early years, and I used to love reading the, uh, the the Sports Illustrated issue that would come out about two weeks later and and read all of the negative letters to the editor that were in the, the magazine about the Sports Illustrated swimsuit issues. Those were hilarious to me. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, we'll wait and see. I mean, the, for what it's worth, there is, uh, you know, there, there are online publications now. The Athletic has made a, a, a real uh, uh, inroads in the last... Uh, I guess about six years or so since it came out and the athletic has, you know, professional athletes is contributing writers. So, um, you know, you're actually hearing things from the horse's mouth there, but you know, there you're maybe not getting a fair balanced, uh, 
perspective of a story. You're, you're getting what, you know, the athlete wants you to read, but, um, uh, no, just a sort of a sad event for me because Sports Illustrated had such a an impact on on my career. I can honestly say that, and uh, to see that uh, magazine now really going into its final stages is is just kind of sad. Um, let's move on, uh, Gary. Uh, you've wanted to talk for a couple of weeks here about uh, Live Golf, and uh, you know it's it's now uh, you know into its probably third year, second or third year, as we're heading into another, uh, you know, the start of another uh, golf season. Um, what are your thoughts on on Live as it continues to, you know, try to really take hold of the golf world? It's, uh, it, it, you know, as we all know, it's got money uh, galore. It's uh, funded by the Saudis and uh, it's attracted some big names. Uh, but is it winning its battle for golf supremacy over the PGA Tour, I, uh, quite. I'm not. I'm not a fan. I. I. I don't. Uh, I don't like it. Uh, it's not the kind of golf that uh, that I enjoy uh, watching. Um, you know, you, you can't. Uh, you know, you can't argue with the decisions that uh, that, that some of these kids have made. <clears throat> excuse me to to go over there. Uh, with the kind of money that uh, that you know that's being thrown around, uh, you know, I, Rom here is just, uh, I think he just signed up for uh, for 500, uh, 500 million, I guess it was that uh, they gave him to to go over there, um, you know, and and they've attracted some of the the, the top players from the PGA, uh, you know, DJ and Cameron Smith and Reed and Phil and Kepka and um, you know all, all great players. There's no question, um, and. and uh, the, the thing that uh, that probably bothered me uh, initially was, you know, that, that the rationale and the rationale that they tried to sell as to why they went over there and, and, and the, you know, this new way of playing and it, um, when in actual fact uh, w with the money they're being offered, uh, I, I think that that was probably paramount in their decisions. And, and uh, as I said, I, you can't blame them. You can't blame them for, for, for taking that kind of, that kind of money, but the, the actual golf that they play, uh, 54 whole tournaments. Uh, there's only 48 players, 48 players on their tour and, uh, four man teams. Anyhow, I, it's, uh, the, the thing that, that, that really that they don't have and that, uh, I think is most important is the, the, the final nine on Sunday. And that, that, that's a thing that's most exciting to me. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and, an opportunity for a kid like uh, the kid that just won this week, an amateur 20 year old kid. Uh, you'd be, you, you probably know this, Randy, a kid from the university of Alabama. Um, it, it, it's good to see them have some success down there in that school. Um, but uh, anyhow, he, yeah, he just won as an amateur and uh, you know, maybe he doesn't get that opportunity, uh, you know, with the, if these other guys are back there. So what I like to see, uh, these guys make a decision or they've made a decision, then stay there. Uh, the, what I wouldn't give them the opportunity uh, is to come back and play in the majors. Uh, I, I don't care, quite frankly, myself, if I see them again. I'd rather watch some of these new kids coming up from the, the Corn Ferry Tour, uh, from college in the States, like this Dunlap kid. Uh, and and uh, I, I get just as much excitement watching them. Uh, as these other guys, and, and uh, like I said, I, I can't relate to the money that uh, you know that, that they were given. Um, but uh, heck, I, I still uh, I still look in flyers to see if I can get a better deal on peanut butter at uh, at Best Buy or, or uh, at Independent. So I I can't relate to the money. But uh, anyhow, they they made that decision. That's great. Uh, go have fun with it. Uh, play in your short pants and and, and whatever. Uh, but uh, I'm a PGA Tour guy. Yeah, I'm not a fan. I'm not a fan of it of the of the live myself right now. I, you know, I, I I'm with you, Gary, in the sense of the way the structure is of it. But I'll say this: is that the PGA created their own monster because those golfers that were playing on that PGA Tour, they were in complete control of what they could pay them, what they could do, and how they traveled and entries and all that was pretty well a monopoly for the PGA. And in many ways, when you look at it, you know, you look at your top athletes in the world, like in football or hockey or baseball, when they travel to another city to play a game, 
their hotels are paid for, their flights are paid for, they get their, their, their you know, all their equipment's brought to them there, everything's set up for them. A golfer in the PGA Tour has to pretty well travel on his own, his own expense. They have sponsors sometimes. They've got good sponsors, bad sponsors. They have to, you know, they're basically the sponsors try to pay their entry fees and they get to have a hotel they have to pay for. They pay all their own expenses throughout that whole situation. And the fees that they're being paid and the purses they were getting, you know, there were some great purses, but it was at the top and the bottom down kind of got left with the scraps. So they put themselves in a position for another league to kind of, I'm not really a big fan of the VIV. I don't like the fact that where the money comes from, you know, but you gotta, you gotta realize it's a business and the PGA and they're now trying to work with the VIV to, to merge at some point. They're trying to work towards that. And maybe it'll build more money for the players in that, in that, in that, uh, in, in golf. But I just believe that, you know, I, 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 I don't really, um, I don't have a lot of animosity to the ones that went to the VIP tour. They went there for a reason. I really look at the PGA and they really have to change what they're doing with their structure. Yeah. To me, it just sort of brings back memories of when all of these other, uh, uh, minor leagues, if you want to call them that sort of came along like the AFL back in around 1960 and the WHA in, uh, 72. I remember, I mean, I was 13 years old when the WHA came along and I remember feeling animosity too, when, you know, Bobby Hall left the Blackhawks to go play for the Winnipeg Jets. And when Gordie Howe left, uh, the Red Wings to play for, I can't remember if it was Houston or, or Hartford. Hartford. Um, but I, I remember that, those feelings and, and, you know, but with time, sure enough, the AFL merged into the NFL and the WHA four teams at least merged into the NHL. And, you know, here you are now years later thinking, wow, it's, it was great that those leagues came along and, and created what we have now. I don't hold it against the guys for wanting to leave. Everybody wants to make the most money they can. And to some guys' credit, they, they've turned it down. Uh, uh, Tommy Fleetwood the other day uh, turned down a good offer from Liv. So, um, yeah, we'll, we'll just see where it goes. I, I, I'm with you guys. I'm, I'm not crazy about it. But at the same time, I totally understand where they're coming from. And I think with time, this will all work itself out and golf will be better for it. Lance, what what you don't like about it is what I like about it. Um, it it's uh, they're not pampered. It's not like the other sports that everything is taken care of. Um, they get paid based on performance, and if they don't perform, uh, they don't make the cut. They don't get paid. Uh, you, you know, so it, it's a totally different way, a, a different approach. Um, and as a fan. Uh, I, I like it on Friday when, when they're grinding and you're, and you're watching the, the, the tournament on TV and they're grinding to try and make that cut uh, so that, uh, you know, they, they do get a paycheck that week. Um, so I, 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 I like the pay structure. I like how they do it. Um, it, it definitely is different. But, boy, they're, they're, you know, you look at the issues, uh, you know, in the other sports in terms of the contracts that they sign, the way they're pampered. Uh, you know, they, they take days off to rest. Uh, you never know when a team's coming in if the superstar is going to play uh, because he might need a couple days off or he's not going to play back to back. You play golf, you're going to golf back to back. You're going to golf uh, four rounds uh, if you make the cut. You're going to go to the tour event next week if, if uh, you know, you're struggling a little bit. And, and uh, so I like it. I, I, I prefer that to the other side. No, I like the structure of the PGA in that regard. Yeah, for sure. But I just think the PGA has to recognize that there's, you know, the money that they need to pay these guys to play has to be there for them. That's all. And that's there's, what the tour is doing. Is there, Liv is bringing there, back players from the Yeah, money. there's not the money that there is at Live, but there's a lot of money. Over at Live, uh, there's four-man teams. Uh, if you happen to be on the team that wins, you could win millions of dollars and probably shoot six or seven over par but because you're on Rom's team, that's how they get paid. Uh, I, I think it's baloney. Uh, the, 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 the PGA, the, uh, the way they do it, uh, it, it's an individual thing, always has been. And, uh, and you know, there's not the same amount of money. But uh, the, 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 if, if this Dunlop had, a, had a, uh, 
uh, wasn't an amateur, he'd have taken home 1.5 million this week. Uh, that's yeah, that, that, nice. you know, that, that ain't bad. That Going ain't to bad. school. Yeah. yeah. Hey, Gary, one thing we have to remember, you and I can't relate to the money that they're making on the live tour, but you know, Lance is a former NHL referee. Well, yeah, he got paid he millions. Can, he can relate. <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, he's, he's been in sports illustrated. Like, yeah, for exactly. Him, for heaven's sakes. I, yeah. I, 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 I didn't get a dime I, for that. <laughs> we, we can't, we can't do anything that compares to that. So, <laughs> <laughs> I had to carry my bag around everywhere I went when I was refereeing. So I, oh, you're right, Gary. These guys are pampered. <laughs> hey, listen, guys, we're out of time. We got to run. Uh, Want to mention to uh, everyone watching out there, please remember to like, subscribe, and comment. And you can also email us at what do you know about sports at gmail.com. That's the best way to, to reach us. And uh, let me put it this way we read all your emails. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> fellas thanks a lot uh have a great week and uh hopefully we've got lots more to talk about when we uh convene again in about seven days all right guys take care yeah see you next week <laughs>